part of the celebration is to come up yeah, with materials, true. educational materials, that true. celebrate the heritage of our community. Mm -hmm. And if you go in the back, there are some new brochures of the, of the various uh, traveling exhibits that we have. There is one in particular that is very important, has a color part in our website, is the historical uh, chronology that we have put together with some maps, some kind of introductory material for uh, teaching the Puerto Rican history in the U.S. to high school and college students. We have teaching guides in our website. We have complementary open courseware with syllabus and teachers lecturing and, and all kind of resources with one goal in mind, that the next time we meet in our 50th anniversary, the average age of the composition of this crowd will be much lower than it is tonight. It's an effort to get to the young people in our community and let them know of the heritage and the value of the Puerto Rican community. So uh, I don't have much else to say, but I would really like to, uh, to tell you that this is a special year and this is a special evening tonight. Uh, we have a surprise. I'm just going to show you a little bit of what's coming. And, and the man who has put all this together and who's going to guide, you, guide us through all of this is my very uh, good colleague from Altos College. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I know a lot of people in the room, but there are a few that I don't know. But in case you don't, my name is Carlos Sanabria. And uh, yes, a colleague from <coughs> Postos Community College, and I was part of the group uh, that worked here at the center from the very beginning. And um, I'm just going to say a few words of introduction and make some acknowledgments and act as a little bit of an MC. Uh, the first thing I want to uh, acknowledge is that um, this was put together by no means by myself, but by a lot of people that immediately uh, heard that we wanted to do a tribute to the Campos, Campos, uh, volunteered their time, volunteered their, their, their talents. And I want to highlight some of those people, beginning with Manuel Otero. Manuel, maybe you could just... Uh, Manuel Otero was also one of the original uh, people here at, at the Centro. And I want to uh, say that Manuel was the big key person in putting together the publication that we're going to be distributing you know, later on in the evening. I also want to acknowledge um, Edwin Melendez, who you just heard from, immediately that um, the suggestion was made that we have this evening to honor Ricardo's memory. He immediately said yes. And not only uh, Edwin, but he put at the disposal of those of us that were working on this, uh, everybody else on staff. And I want to also acknowledge Alberto Hernandez, the director of the Library and Archives, uh, Pedro Juan Hernandez, uh, Diego Valencia, all of them uh, really worked uh, very hard to get a lot of the images that appear in this publication. Evelyn Coyasso, uh, very, very instrumental in organizing this event. I also want to acknowledge uh, Pedro Rivera, who's here with us today. Pedro, maybe you could raise your hand. Uh, Pedro, um, also a very you know, a colleague from the very early days of the Centro, very close friend of Ricardo's. And, um, Later on in life, uh, Ricardo um, entrusted to Pedro a lot of his personal papers. And a lot of the personal pictures that we have in this publication are thanks to um, you know, the generosity of, of Pedro to share them with us. So I wanted to acknowledge that as well. And um, last but never least, I want to say a thank you to my wife, Chris Samaria. And uh, having said that, I want to acknowledge the presence of so many people here. And I think really it's a uh, little testimony to the esteem and the love that many people have for Ricardo. We have people here from Chicago, Massachusetts, New Jersey, which sometimes is a lot further than, uh, than we imagine. And um, we have a very close friend of Ricardo's who actually uh, spent the last years of Ricardo uh, very, very close uh, and, uh, and dear to him. Carmelo Otero. Carmelo, <laughs> Carmelo uh, you know, Ricardo, you know, took ill in Puerto Rico, and it reached the moment when he didn't want to be a burden to those that were near to him. And he came to New York, and being to a lot of us that had worked with him and, you know, knew him for so many years. <laughs> 
come on. Okay, yes. Carnelo is uh, a little on the shy side, so he doesn't want to speak. But I did want to acknowledge Carnelo because when Ricardo made the decision to return to New York, and he made that decision because he didn't want to be a burden to the people that were close to him in Puerto Rico, um, there were a few people that were close to him, friends, and Carmelo was, was among them. And Carmelo was with him for probably the last 10 years, and he was with him right until the end, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, Ricardo was a special person, and uh, it was because of his generosity uh, as a human being, and also because of his achievements as a scholar. He was unique among uh, Puerto Rican scholars that uh, began working in the early 1970s. That generation of Puerto Rican scholars that began to work on what's referred to as you know, history from the bottom up, uh, history, uh, social history. And he was unique because as far as I know, he's the only one that was an integral part of CEDEP, the Center for the Study of Puerto Rican Reality in Puerto Rico, and who subsequently came to New York and was an integral part of the work of the Centro. I don't think there's anybody else that took part in both of these institutions and made significant contributions to the work of both those groups. And of course, um, Ricardo is a very generous individual. I think that's one of the things that most drove me about Ricardo. He was generous just about everything. I mean, he was generous with his time. He was generous with his work. He was generous with any material things that he had, any money that he had. And one of the things that most struck me was that as a scholar, he was so generous with his sources and materials and his ideas. I um, mean, uh, unfortunately, there are some scholars that are more reticent to share you know, some of what they have, right? Maybe somebody else get the jump on anything. But um, he, was, he, was, he was really wonderful in that way. And it was an aspect uh, of his generosity, um, the way that he shared just, just everything about him. As an intellectual, he was the, the kind that Edward Said referred to when he said um, that who as an individual, Ricardo was endowed with the faculty of representing, embodying, articulating a message, a view, an attitude, a philosophy, or opinion, as well as for a public, to as well as for a public. And in this role has an edge to it and cannot be played without a sense of being someone whose place it is publicly to raise embarrassing questions, to confront orthodoxy and dogma rather than to produce them, to be someone who cannot be easily co-opted by governments or corporations, and whose reason for being is to represent all those people and issues that are routinely forgotten and swept under the rug. And uh, this is the kind of you know, intellectual academic that Ricardo was. And um, the work that we reproduce here in this publication, which will be distributed uh, later, uh, is one of the early pieces that he did where he does just that, to represent <coughs> those whose history has been swept under the rug, the history of the origins of the Puerto Rican working class and that radical movement at the beginning of the 20th century that sought to transform uh, reality there. And in his work with Seret, he was an integral part of that group they wanted not just to understand reality, but to transform reality. And we have people here that are visiting that are going to speak to uh, that aspect of his life, his political work. And uh, in the central, he also was uh, mm -hmm. instrumental in telling the story that hadn't been told, the story of Puerto Rican labor migration to the United States and the origins of those conditions that led to um, this community is an underclass, and, and helping us to understand that dynamic within the framework of capitalism and U.S. colonialism in Puerto Rico. So that he made many, many significant contributions, and um, among them also was bringing to light uh, the biographies of some of the early Puerto Rican labor leaders, and he worked closely with Taller Boricua, unfortunately, we were, were not able to communicate with some of the people who are still working with Taller Boricua, but uh, helped to produce in the early 70s a series of silk screens of some of the early Puerto Rican labor leaders. And happily, thanks to the work of the Centro, the work of, of uh, Manuel Otero, also want to acknowledge the presence and the assistance of Amita Tirado, who's made this possible. So um, I'd like to just go on with the program. There is a printed program. Um, hopefully you have copies. I do want to emphasize that, um, you know, Ricardo didn't stand on ceremony. And uh, we just want to emphasize that this is an informal event. And uh, we want to you know, share our memories of Ricardo. And we want to do that in a relaxed and 
uh, informal way as possible. I know there's lots of people here who haven't seen themselves, seen each other in decades, and hopefully we will at the end of the program have an occasion to uh, go around and hug each other. But uh, I want to go on with the program, and uh, in this publication, again, that we'll be distributing later, uh, we produced two of Ricardo's favorite poems. Los Heraldos Negros, uh, de César Vallejo, en no. Alma Ausente, de Federico García Lorca. And we also are uh, blessed to have the presence of Miguel Concepcion, a colleague from Boston's Community College, who um, has volunteered to come up and recite those poems for us. By pure coincidence, it turned out that Miguel Concepcion is also from Catania, and when he saw the picture in the publication, he says, oh, that's, uh, that's Catania, we're going to look in the bay over to Old San Juan, uh, something that I had realized. But um, Miguel is also from Catania, it happens that Miguel's family and uh, Ricardo's families knew each other. So in addition to uh, reciting these two poems, Miguel is going to share some thoughts and uh, reminiscences of the early years of Ricardo in Catania. <laughs> Buenas noches y gracias por darle este homenaje a un compueblano mío, eh, el pueblo más pequeño de la isla y pues que tiene tantos motes, ¿no? el que se negó a morir, la antesala de la ciudad capital que lo odiamos mucha gente porque Cataño es Cataño, ¿no? Eh, y pues compartimos esa amada bahía eh, y Ricardo Campos pues fue un ser que poco tiempo que estuvo en Cataño, que después se vino para acá, eh, la gente que lo conoció, en especial mi tío Jaime, eh, mi abuelo Luis Concepción, pues tienen gratos recuerdos de él. El primer poema de Ricardo que eh, el compañero Carlos me dio es Alma Ausente de Pablo, eh, Federico García Lorca, perdón, y dice así, no te conoce el toro ni la higuera, ni caballos ni hormigas de tu casa, no te conoce tu recuerdo mudo, porque te has muerto para siempre. No te conoce el lomo de la piedra, ni el raso negro donde te destrozas. No te conoce tu recuerdo mudo, porque te has muerto para siempre. El otoño vendrá con caracolas, uva de niebla y montes agrupados, pero nadie querrá mirar tus ojos, porque te has muerto para siempre porque te has muerto para siempre, como todos los muertos de la tierra, como todos los muertos que se olvidan en un montón de perros apagados. No te conoce nadie, no, pero yo te canto. Yo canto para luego tu perfil y tu gracia, la madurez insigne de tu conocimiento, tu apetencia de muerte y el gusto de su boca. Tristeza que tuvo tu valiente alegría tardará mucho tiempo en nacer si es que nace un andaluz tan claro, tan rico de aventura. Yo canto su elegancia con palabras que gimen y recuerdo una brisa triste por los olivos. De César Vallejo, los eran dos negros. Hay golpes en la vida tan fuertes, yo no sé. Golpes como del odio de Dios, como si ante ellos la resaca de todo lo sufrido se posara en el alma. Yo no sé, son pocos, pero son. Abren zanjas oscuras en el rostro más fiero y en el lomo más fuerte. Serán tal vez los potros de bárbaros atiras o los heraldos negros que nos manda la muerte. Son las caídas ondas de los cristos del alma, de alguna fe adorable que el destino blasfema. Esos golpes sangrientos son las crepitaciones de algún pan que en la puerta del horno se nos quema. El hombre, pobre, pobre, vuelve los ojos como cuando por sobre el hombro nos llama una palmada. Vuelve los ojos locos todo lo vivido se emposa como charco de culpa en la mirada. Hay golpes en la vida tan fuertes, yo no sé. Eh, gracias. Yo, 
eh, no tuve la, la dicha de conocerlo personalmente, pero como bien dije, eh, mi familia lo conoció, mi tío, mi papá, mi abuelo. Y hablando con tío Jaime, pues me dijo, pues mira, nosotros éramos unos títeres de la, de la playa de Cataño, ¿no? A Ricardo le gustaba tirar mucha piedra y buscar pelea. Y le gustaba ligar. Cosa de que, pues, en aquellos años de esa playa tan hermosa que ya no existe, ¿no? Eh, pues, eh, estudió en el Colegio San Vicente Ferrer y en el Colegio Santo Tomás de Aquino de San Juan, San Vicente en Cataño. Eh, su papá trabajaba en el Army Central y él tuvo y el, su hermano Pepito Campos, que es un médico también famoso, de, de especialista en el riñón en Puerto Rico, tuvieron la, el privilegio de tener una buena educación. Después su papá lo mandó a España, por razones que pues, todo el mundo puede tal vez eh, conocer, pero allá se educó, se terminó de formar y regresó a Cataño después ya enfermo vivió en una casa de mi abuelo que se la alquilaron por un tiempo y pues eh, deambulaba por el pueblo, yo digo que sembrando conocimientos y poniendo semillas de, de, de saber en cada esquina y en esa bahía tan hermosa nuestra. Eh, gracias nuevamente, gracias Carlos por la invitación y espero pues que sean muchos los homenajes que se le hagan a Ricardo y a gente como Ricardo que venimos de sitios humildes, pero con mucha fuerza y mucho amor y que le damos mucho a la patria. Gracias. Thank you, Miguel. You know, it's interesting to me uh, to learn things that I just didn't know about Ricardo. Uh, now, of course, you know, after he's passed away. And again, by pure coincidence, Uh, Miguel Concepcion is a colleague at Osco's Community College, and it turns out that, you know, their families knew each other and all of this. And it was also news to me uh, to find out uh, a few days ago, really, that another colleague from Osco's Community College, Felipe Pimentel, who's our next uh, speaker, uh, was actually a student of Ricardo's at the University of Puerto Rico, and who uh, knows the history of how Ricardo ended up coming to New York. And as it turned out, Felipe was one of those that helped Ricardo pack his books when he came to New York. No, he was already here. Milton Pavón. Milton Pavón, all right. Well, I can't correct him. Anyway, um, he's going to share some of his uh, reminiscences of Ricardo from uh, Ricardo's days at the UPR. Yeah. First, let me, uh, good evening. First, I don't prepare. I don't have any huh? I will talk from the top of my mind. Uh, when Carlos told me about this event, I said, no, but you're Ricardo. Uh, when I was very young, well, I was 19 years old. He came back to Puerto Rico. Um, Miguel mentioned that he went to Spain. He came in 1972 to the Department of Political Science. And he taught a code of anarchism. I happened to be at that time a Marxist myself. Uh, I had at that moment taken a course before with uh, Professor Pablo Garcia on Mars. We had just finished the course on Lenin. But I had my issue with Mars and my Marxism even at that time. And Ricardo offered this course, I was curious. And uh, it was a very intense course. We read a lot, you cannot imagine. Uh, Bakunin, Proposki, Manotesta. <laughs> and Ricardo was basically an anarchist. An anarchist, yeah. <laughs> he came from Spain, he was influenced by the CNT and FI, Federación Anarquista Ibérica. And I was fascinated by him. In fact, we read a book that I still have, uh, the Gang of In, Marxismo Libertario, that opened my eyes, and at that moment, uh, Professor uh, uh, Arcadio Bombea at the UPR, uh, Marxism was still the dominant uh, ideology among students. I used to be an activist in one of these student organizations. And uh, then, after that, uh, we took a, I took a call with him. Uh, That was very, for me, very important on Cultura Obrera, yeah, on working class culture. And I have to tell you that I, the only professor that told me how to do research in primary sources, he brought us to the, to the Puerto Rican collection, the Puerto Rican collection at the UPR. Uh, and he was, was complaining, I need to tell to say this, that many of the primary sources have been stolen, you know? He, he wanted that. That in that class, we had to write a, a, a paper using your primary sources. And I did a paper on Isaac Petillo, 
um, working class theater and poetry. And I spent hours, you know, all this paper, yellow paper with uh, humid. Uh, a lot of paper had been cut. Uh, and then Ricardo said to me, I remember, we have to save this collection. That's why he did it later here, there was a centro. I don't remember that he got some money, some money, and he went back to microfilm all these newspapers. I suppose that we have a very collection here in, the, uh, uh, in New York of those sources that we well, well, still have in Puerto Rico. And uh, for me, it was fascinating because at the UPR, there were two professors that really changed me. I was going to be a lawyer, I never thought of being an academic. And there, there were Mito Pavón, who was the chair of the department, and Ricardo Campo. Uh, because I was the leader of the student organization, we had a strike in 1979, in 1973. And we basically took over the university, that was in the fall. And Ricardo was a young faculty, you know? But Ricardo was very pro student, and then he used to hang out every day there where we had taken over in the student residence. Even if all the people were telling him, you say, you are exposing yourself. You should not be here. So Ricardo, for 30 days, we occupied the university for 30, 40 days. Every day, he even sleep in, in, among with students sometimes. Uh, at the end of the strike, uh, the administration fired six you know, faculty. Uh, you don't need to imagine who was one of them. <laughs> but, uh, I remember two of them who were very important, uh, uh, Benjamin Stahl, and Ricardo Campo, who, who are very important in terms of history, were fired. I don't remember what happened with Benjamin Stahl. I think he went to New Orleans or to the South. I don't remember what happened with him. But Ricardo, because the connection between Milton and, and Frank Borilla was able to move to New York. I happened very happily, Ricardo was married to this Spanish woman, I don't remember her name. He lives in Fairview. And interestingly, uh, when he was fired, he was doing this, he was writing this paper that later became a very known paper about Junta de Cultura Obrera. Uh, I have let Ricardo the book. I have bought this book of uh, Adolfo Sánchez Vázquez, Estética y Marxismo, two volumes, that I read but I didn't understand, to be honest. That was very heavy. And Ricardo asked me for the book, because he needed the framework. And I forgot to add the book back, and then when we were moving his stuff, uh, the movie, I found my books. But I said, you know, keep it. And he kept the book, uh, I don't know what the book what we have now, or the, 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 no, 40 years ago. Uh, but I, I, it was very fascinating, you know, because Ricardo was very meticulous, very demanding as a professor, very serious, and in terms of teaching basic skills like doing historical research, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a historian myself, but I have to recognize that I learned some of the things uh, in that class on Cultura Obrera. Then uh, he left in, in 74, 74, he came here. At that moment, the Centro had that event on, on Cultura. I know that he became very close to, to Juan Flores. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of things more, and then I will stop. I saw Rica, I went to Europe, happened to him in France. Uh, and because I was, you know, in a transition, uh, at that moment in France, uh, what was uh, happening was the uh, communism, you know, the idea of democracy and socialism. Then I came back to New York in 1977, and I went to the centro that was located at John Jay. Ricardo used to chat with uh, Felipe Ojeda. And he said, Felipe, I, I'm going to bring you to this meeting tonight. And I said, well, I, I, because he was involved at that moment in a communist movement, a communist party. And then he brings me to this meeting, the most Stalinian, I mean, a Stalinian party. And I remember, I was shocked because this guy, who happened to be an anarchist before, now was into hard Marxism. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> and then, I'm trying to make a question here. He said, Felipe, I remember the name of the leader. He is really a worker. And that is the continuity here. He kind of an anarchist first. Then he became a, an orthodox Marxist, but the continuity, the link here is his workerism. I mean, Ricardo was passionate about the working class. Uh, in Italian, we say opera, operaismo. In French, we say obrerism. Uh, in, in English, it's workerism. He was basically a, a workerist. And I think all his research, all his work, was framed with that, with that perspective. Uh, 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 Carlos has said he collaborated with uh, Cerebra and, and the people Quintero Rivera and others. 
at that time, we we had discovered, I know that I know part of that as well, uh, we, 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 we were discovering the working class. I remember I read a Milcar uh, piece on Romero Rosso, what is it, what is it? At that time with Ricardo, I, and in terms of formation, like okay, formation, I have to say, you know, uh, it was really an honor and a pleasure to have a professor like Ricardo. Uh, I thought, I mean, I, I don't know what happened with him later, we changed course, but in terms of remembering and memories, I said people from I think remember in the UPR, uh, one of them is Ricardo, you know? Another one is Don Pavón, Don Pablo Garcia, and for me, when I'm not now older, <laughs> I was only 19 years old at that time, uh, I still feel a lot of, you know, uh, I feel, I would say, uh, I'm thank, uh, uh, gracias and grateful for having been exposed to him at that point in my life. Okay, thank you. Experiencing a little bit of a moment of deja vu over here because I'm seeing so many people that were part of that, uh, you know, original central group. That uh, for a second there, I thought maybe we were going to have one of those internal central collective meetings for <laughs> <laughs> the retreats that we had. But uh, I do want to acknowledge the presence of so many that we're really close to Ricardo and in collaborators, colleagues, uh, Blanca Vasquez, who's here with us. Uh, Michi Lesser, who was never part of the center, but very close to, to us. Pedro Pedraza, uh, who worked at the center from the very beginning. Ana Huarbe, also, remember those meetings. Uh, Cabrera. Uh, Iris Lopez, who also was not you know, part of the center, but very close to us, and who is here today as well. And then, of course, Fides Cortez, who worked very closely with Ricardo um, in that you know, culture task force. Betty Garcia is here as well. And she was uh, also very close to us at the center. Esperanza Martel, also here with us, uh, very much an integral part of that group, even though she wasn't one of our you know, formal collective. Um, and of course, Renee Lopez. Uh, Ricardo and, and Renee were very close and shared a lot in terms of music. Um, Miriam Jimenez also was with us for a while at, at the center. Um, Arcadio Diaz Quinones is here with, uh, as well. Um, also very much a part of the intellectual work that Ricardo participated in. I still remember the uh, Princeton Colloquium that um, he participated in there. He you know, Ricardo, you know, helped to make that possible. And of course, Juan, Juan Flores, who is our next speaker, um, worked probably uh, was the one person that worked most closely with Ricardo in terms of a lot of the intellectual work that was done. And Juan is going to come up now and say also a few words. out there and I see the blast from the past. Um, but I want to thank Carlos for taking this on. I mean, I think it's, I think we should give him a little applause. For this. <laughs> and Manolo, Manuel, that we always called Neko, so I, pardon me if I'm using that name in, in vain, but anyway, uh, Neko, I think the two of them got, got it together and I think it was really the appropriate people, but so many people here could be doing what I'm doing, which is just talk about the central collaboration. Almost, you know, half the people that are in this room were part of that same exact process. Um, and so I, but I was particularly privileged, I think, to be able to work so closely with Ricardo. And it was, he was one of the guys that um, I think I've worked, I've worked more closely with anybody in, in my life when I think about it, where we actually sat at a table and wrote things sentence by sentence. Do you agree on that sense? Let's go to the next sense. Sometimes you, when you co-author, you write a piece and then the other person writes a piece and then you come back to you and you write and you do it that way, but this was really, he was that way, those of you who knew him, he was very scrupulous, and he wanted every de the dot on every I, and across on every P, and it had to be just so, so that you had to make your sentences be really ring ring true, according to uh, the way he, he he liked to see things, and, and so that was a, a great sharing experience for me, uh, and I think it's really important, uh, and I thank the contemporary configuration of the Centro, for, for bringing this part of the history back. Uh, it's a very important to bring out the foundations of the Centro. The, the first years were the ones where the intellectual base was, was, was set for the whole institution and the whole intellectual project uh, that the Centro is uh, and remains. Uh, and the reason why it has 
retained its intellectual um, uh, supremacy within the work on, on Latinos in the U.S. and on Puerto Ricanos here and there. So, uh, so that is something that I think we should always bear in mind when we celebrate the history of this institution, that we have people who really set the foundation. And Ricardo was certainly one of them, uh, uh, very important um, from the beginning. And I, I, I'd want to uh, accentuate uh, what Carlos was saying before about this person's generosity. He was amazing. His door was always open. All of you have gone in through his door. And he was ready to hear what you had to say and contribute um, his ideas you know, to figuring that out in a very humble kind of a way. Um, I think uh, that another thing that needs to be said is that um, talking about the kind of intellectual that he was, uh, there was a good word that uh, Ramshi made up, a good term called the organic intellectual. And if there was ever an organic intellectual, it was Ricardo Campos. He was a guy, unlike the other people mentioned, uh, in all due respect, from Serep and from Milton and the other people, he was one of the few, or the one, only one I really knew, that came from the working class. That he was a strong proletarian that we're working with. And so when he talks about proletarian ideology and proletarian perspective, and the reason why he was so passionate about it is that that was his own life. And those were his own people that he was talking about. So some of the discrepancies that came up had to do with that. Like, you know, who is it that's doing this interpretation and what for? Uh, uh, and as we know, uh, Ricardo had, knew how to wage an ideological struggle that some Felipe was kind of getting at in a way that, you know, you don't mess with Ricardo, you know, you're going to have an argument on your hands. And I think that was to his credit, not to, not to, uh, to discredit him. I also was privileged, I, I was very privileged to, to be able to be there when Frank and Ricardo were working together. Right? We spent hours and hours together uh, uh, and it was mainly, I was mainly, you know, kind of more of a witnessing and facilitating capacity because these two guys were, were giants, you know, and, and they were very different minds. You know, Frank had this, a very empirical kind of mind and he wanted the facts and he wanted the policy issues to be brought out and where so Ricardo had this, you know, immensely theoretical framework that he was bringing to bear on it. And somehow or other they found a common ground and, and were able to produce some very important analysis together uh, even though they were really coming from different angles, you know, to the same thing. So it was really interesting to see how they would crunch the same numbers, you know, they would have the same data and statistics and be able to weave all these incredible uh, lines of analysis out of it. Uh, so that that, you know, meaning of the minds was really, uh, really helpful to me. And then, of course, it was on me to translate everything. <laughs> so I had to translate uh, mostly into the English from Ricardo's, translating Ricardo's Spanish into English was uh, was a mean task, uh, and particularly because he had that chicken scrawl that many of you probably remember that he wrote in a way that nobody could understand what the hell he wrote. So you had to kind of I had to get used to deciphering, you know, that language and that kind of handwriting that that we had um, uh, that we had there. So when the labor migration of capitalism, when the editing process came about, you know, I had pages that were typed and looked okay, but other pages that were that were additions and addenda to the text that were in, 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 in Ricardo's chicken scroll, and that was like, that made me be very attentive to, um, uh, you know, to what was being said and, and the, the lines of analysis that were being made, uh, that, that. So, so when you get to be there for a co-thinking kind of process with Ricardo and Frank, there together, and here I am trying to juggle, like, what's going on here, and learning from both, of course, and I think that uh, it was really a model kind of collaboration between the two of them. And I was just lucky to be able to sit in on it and to facilitate and help out, you know, with that process. And then, as far as Ricardo himself is concerned and his contribution and everything, I think it's been brought out well how dynamic, you know, he was as an intellectual. Really, really, he lived it. He didn't just have that as part of leave it, leave it in the office when he went home. It was all day, right, Pedro? It was like day and night, you know, and, and like there was no way around it. You know, when you're with, when you're with Ricardo, you got your thinking cap on. You know, and so that's that's the kind of guy he was. Very intense, you know. Probably one of the most intense people you'd ever want to be. And, uh, and but it, but it served him well because it, it drove him, you know, in a way that was uh, that was really impressive and uh, that was really something admirable to say. But I think that as far as his um, uh, his strong strongest suit, while he ranged really widely from 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 empirical social, social science. He really was a Frank and he were working very empirical stuff. But he ranged way over to, you know, he loved art and poetry as, as came out and, and he liked to talk about culture and, and things. So he worked with us in the cultural work as well uh, uh, as, as in the Migration and History Task Force. 
Uh, but I think his really his greatest strength though was a political theory. I think he was really really strong in that. You know, he would say, talk to him, and he would bring out the the, anarch, the Spanish anarchists in a way that you know I know many, but he knew so much about them. And he could really articulate what each of those guys was trying to say, and and then bring it into the framework of Marxism, which was his was his perspective. Even when he was a an anarchist, he was still very much uh, very familiar with uh, with Marxism and Leninism and so forth. And I think he never really left the anarchism behind. I mean, he he he. he he, it's, it was it was superseded in a way by by a, by, by a very strong orthodox Marxism uh, is what he became. Uh, but there was always a, there was always a very very strong I think Mar anarchist streak in Ricardo. He was a, an anarchist Marxist. Let's put it that way. If you can if you can appreciate that, you know. And I think that's where I found him to be most fascinating in the world when he talked about intellectual history. Peter Bowl, some of the some of the encyclopedists, you know, the, uh, the political theorists of the Enlightenment. The guy was amazing. You know, the kind of things that he read and what he was able to to, to uh, preserve from them and apply them then also to the analysis that we were doing. So uh, I have, you know, I, I just remember him so fondly, and and uh, he was so important to me uh, and to all of us, I'm sure. And I hope I, I'm speaking well on behalf of many of you that are here uh, in just saying that he was a very special person, a unique guy, and uh, we all miss him a lot. And let's just try to carry on his legacy and not forget Ricardo Campos. Thank you. We have uh, two more speakers on the program that are going to come up. And then after that, we want to just open it up to <coughs> everyone present to come up and say words of remembrance about Ricardo. Before I continue, I do want to acknowledge, you know, one more person, last but not least, um, my sister Olga Sanabria, who's here. Yeah. And Olga also, <laughs> Olga also is one who was never part of the Center Collective, but um, who her whole life has really exemplified what Ricardo was about, which was about political change and about the struggle for Puerto Rican independence. And, um, very happy that you're also here with us today. We have uh, Laura Garcia, and Laura Garcia is uh, someone who's going to speak about a different part of Ricardo. We talked a lot about his intellectual work, and by the way, um, Juan mentioned about the difficulties of translating Ricardo, and I can testify to that because I took a stab at this, and you'll read it and you'll judge for yourself. <laughs> uh, very theoretical and uh, tough, but uh, Hopefully, I think a little justice to it. But um, also, uh, one spoke about Ricardo's work ethic, and um, I happen to have shared an apartment with Ricardo for a few years, mm -hmm. and um, I can testify to that because we would travel to work together, and Ricardo had an expression that uh, about working from campana to campana, from bell to bell, from the minute he got into the office to the minute he left, he was working. But uh, it didn't end there, because when we got home, he freshened up, have a little dinner. By the way, he was a great cook. He was a great cook. And it was wonderful to speak to him when he was hungry, because he had great stories about food. Um, but, you know, he'd get home, he'd freshen up, he'd have something to eat, and then he'd get to work again. And he'd work another whatever, you know, three, four, five hours. And about his generosity, I was always also very impressed because he would be deeply concentrated in his work, and you'd come up and interrupt him, and it was okay, you know. He'd stop whatever he was doing, and he'd talk to you and engage with you. And you'd leave, and he'd go back to the work he was doing. But uh, I want to call uh, to, the, to the podium um, Laura Garcia, who's going to share a little bit about Ricardo and the political work that he's doing. many of you that I met 30 years ago and uh, have very good memories uh, of our times together. Um, I want to talk about Ricardo from another, uh, I think someone mentioned, you mentioned that when he moved from Puerto Rico to New York, he became, he uh, joined a communist <laughs> movement organization. He became a member of the Communist Labor Party, yeah, and uh, 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 the party doesn't exist anymore, but I was a, a member of that party at that time, and that's how I met him. 
there's several of us, uh, the compañeros that were with him at that time. There's Joyce, Art, uh, Lenny, Jose, and I won't mention the other ones, but there's a few here that were in the party together with us. And I also want to say that the way I met Titano was because everyone talked about the love that he had for the working class because he was a proletariat himself. And because of that love and for the working class, especially the Puerto Rican worker, he, uh, in a collective here in New York, initiated uh, a column in the Tribuno del Pueblo called El Grito del Pueblo. And, uh, and uh, that's how I met him. That's how we started working in the paper together. But I have a few words that I just want to read because I don't want to, I don't want to mess up. Um, and, um, but I want to say one thing that in f as far as his generosity, he was a wonderful human being. I remember I, um, I visited New York and I was staying at his house and I don't know why he mentioned Goya. I was very young at that time and I didn't know who Goya was. I didn't, wasn't familiar with, the, with his work. And uh, after dinner, he put a slideshow of Goya he had got when he was in Spain. He had taken all these slides and he showed them to me. And he said, this is Goya. This is what he did and so forth. So he was very generous with his uh, knowledge and wanted to always give it to, to those that wanted to listen. But um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to be here today to honor the life and the contributions of our departed comrade Ricardo Campos. No one lives in isolation. The significance of any life is described not only by, the, by their times and social struggles, but by why and how any one of us chooses to relate to them. Comrade Campos was gifted with an exceptionally brilliant mind and with a curiosity that early on led him to question and examine the social system. The ruling class correctly understands such minds are far more dangerous than riots or bombs. They offer permanent regard for the keys to the, to the so-called good life. He rejected them and turn to his class, his nation, and his people. Understanding the complex line of march of the revolution, and yet firmly linked to the working class and its future, Ricardo embodied a revolutionary proletariat intellectual. In his writings and lectures, Carlos Ricardo was in the forefront of the struggle of the unity of Puerto Rican and Anglo-American workers. He deeply understood that freeing Puerto Rico from the oppression and exploitation of imperialism was more than a question <coughs> confronting the Puerto Rican people. It was and is key to the emancipation of the United States working class itself. Comrade Ricardo fully grasped the significance of the statement by Karl Marx that, quote, the English working class will never accomplish anything before it has got rid of Ireland, end of quote. Therefore, while being a staunch and militant defender of the culture and history of Puerto Rico, while in the forefront of the struggle of the battle for independence, Ricardo fought for the unity of all workers in the United States. Before immigration became the burning question that is today, Comrade Ricardo understood its significance. He wrote a number of works tracing the developing pattern of immigration from Puerto Rico into the United States. He saw how this, this was linking the people of Puerto Rico and the United States in a, in a new way. His deep concern for the working class marked him as an outstanding internationalist. Comrade Ricardo has left us. He lived without the legacy 
of a principal and yielding revolutionary. We shall miss him, his warm partnership, his intelligence, and his devotion to the revolution. Rest well, comrade. The fight will go on until we win. Thank you. I feel very fortunate to be here and I want to thank my old friend Neko for somehow, I still don't know, tracking me down on the internet or something, mm -hmm. with Carlos's help. It's been so many years since I've been with and seen most of you, decades. So I feel very moved and very fortunate to reestablish our connections. Um, and I also remembered something when Felipe yeah. was talking before because, um, you know, mostly Ricardo was my dear friend. And, and more than that, and but he was also with Juan dieron un curso in the Graduate Center at CUNY. And when I, I'm sorry, with, with Frank Bonilla, not with you, Juan, forgive me. And, um, and I took it, so I was also his student, in addition to all the other identities that connect me with him. And of course, he and Frank were, as has been noted, very different como maestros and so brilliant. Um, I met Ricardo a few years after returning to New York City <coughs> from Chile following the U.S. engineered coup d'etat, which I probably don't have to remind anybody in this crowd happened on September 11, 1973. The coup hurled hundreds of thousands of Chilenos and their allies to distant shores. In many ways, Ricardo and some of you too were like a sanctuary for me and others who were abruptly separated from Chile's experiment in social justice. And he and many of you created a bridge to El Caribe for those of us who arrived in New York from the extreme south of Las Americas. In the movement for Puerto Rican independence and against colonialism, we found comrades and friends who didn't need us to explain what had happened in Chile and what a relief that was. It was so tiring to have to try to explain. And you understood immediately. Through my friendship with Ricardo, I learned to say chuleria, <laughs> cabron, <laughs> and a bunch of other things I'm not going to say. That <laughs> to eat patagones con sal, <laughs> to make tortillas con huevo y aguacate machacado, y queso y sal y limón. Behind those thick glasses, which made it so hard to see his face. Ricardo was immensely kind, extraordinarily generous, as has been said here, so deeply fair and yearning for justice. Though he had such a hard time allowing himself, in my personal opinion, to live fully and often looked like he was scowling. And a friend asked me a moment ago whether I would in address his internalized oppression. Was it internalized oppression? Was it something in his emotional makeup and how he related to the larger community, something from the family? Yo no sé. I'm not going there. Some of you might be able to, I can't. Blessed with a towering intellect, 
we all know that he devoted it to the struggles against colonialism and imperialism. And he was, as some of you have said, he was fascinante. And he was fascinated by human history and had a particular love for the history of the Spanish Civil War and the Peloponnesian War. Let us not forget it. <laughs> Anybody who has his library, and somebody here might, you will find some wonderful books there on that, perhaps. Back when I knew him, Ricardo was at home, as at home on the street as he was in a library or a classroom. He was a clear and deep thinker who called it like he saw it and was never afraid of offending anyone of any persuasion. He was uncompromising and did not frequently allow great joy to be his companion in my experience. Alongside his brilliance, there was a tormented and at times belligerent <coughs> man, and some might say that in este mundo de tanta injusticia, how could it be any other way? He drove some of his friends crazy and drove some of his friends away, made his bosses cuckoo because he was chronically late with all of his essays and articles, even though it was a 24-7 operation with him and the work. He was also an immensely tender man. We must mention that tenderness. I remember him once talking about Las Hijas, his beloved daughters, Consuelo and Angela, as they approached their adolescence. And he voiced some concern over their mother's strictness and what this would do to them as they went deeper into that path. And I'm not sure what triggered this remark, but I remember him saying, if either of mis hijas were to ever get pregnant, I would be the happiest man in the world. <laughs> I would take them in, I would raise the baby. In a sense, he was, he was speaking for the closeness and <coughs> his indefatigable ability to love. Um, but that sometimes didn't allow itself to get expressed. I wonder if perhaps his downfall came from that unique combination of brilliance and belligerence, torment and tenderness. In some ways, Ricardo was not made for this world. His standards so high, his tolerance of mediocrity so low, his devotion to justice so deep, his intransigence so unwavering, and yet this world, our world, my world, is diminished by his passing, and it saddened me that he had such a hard time finding a place where he belonged. Thank you. We'd like to ask um, anyone else who has some thoughts that they'd like to share, memories that they'd like to share, please step up. Alcalde Diaz Quiñones. Thank you very much, Carlos, and uh, all of you. And uh, I'm, I've been very moved by the testimonies and the words of those who have uh, spoken today. Uh, I cannot say uh, that I knew Ricardo intimately in any way. Uh, I knew him and I admired him. Uh, we met first in Serep, in Puerto Rico, and I still remember nostalgically those uh, meetings, debates with Ricardo, Gervasio Garcia, Angel Quintero Rivera, Marcia Rivera, very intense, very rigorous debates. I was a student of literature, so I 
I did not quite understand sometimes the passion that sociology and historians could bring uh, to the debate, but I joined them. I joined uh, because I was learning quite a bit. And Ricardo, Ricardo was particularly demanding in those meetings. I remember intelligent, rigorous, and with, a, as uh, Felipe said, with a, with a first-hand knowledge of materials that very few had. And as a matter of fact, I think that in relation to workers' history, Puerto Rican workers' history, I think uh, all of us are in debt to him, and so many have used his work, and I think he was glad that they were using his work. Students and writers and historians uh, were able to benefit from his research and his thinking. I think I shared with him something that I remember vaguely conversations, because I also studied in Spain, and we shared an admiration for uh, for the Spanish struggle under Franco, those last years of the Franco regime. Uh, but I want to mention something that uh, I think uh, brings together, uh, because in, the se in, in 1977-78, uh, I came to Princeton as a visiting professor, and they asked me, uh, what would you like to organize? And I said, well, I would like to organize a meeting, uh, a discussion with uh, what's going on today, uh, the writers and historians, the new, a new thinking about Puerto Rican history. Uh, and I was fortunate to be able to organize it there. And we brought uh, 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 Jose Luis Gonzalez, who of course enjoyed the debates and polemics, and he was <laughs> looking for them. And an important Marxist tradition in Puerto Rico. And I, I'm, I'm glad that it has been mentioned here, because I think we need to recover Marxist traditions in the plural, not just one, but various Marxist traditions. Uh, and Ricardo is at the very center, just like Jose Luis Gonzalez and Pablo Garcia and others are at the very center. And it's, this is a good moment to recover, to begin to recover that history and to rethink about it. So uh, then I called uh, uh, someone I admired immensely and, and was uh, had gotten to know a little bit because I was at the center. At the, I visited sometimes, uh, uh, and, and I think that Frank Bonilla uh, needs to be mentioned here too. I called Frank and I said, Frank, uh, I'm organizing a small meeting to debate uh, Puerto Rican history and the trends and the questions, uh, colonial questions, and also social and political issues. And I want to invite you, uh, and uh, Jose Luis Gonzalez will be there, Angel Quintero, and, and I have to honor here Frank Bonilla, whom I greatly admire too, because I remember that he said immediately, uh, thank you, I will not attend, but I'm sending two very young and bright uh, 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 students uh, who are writing already on these issues, and he said, well, who are they? I said, well, uh, Juan Flores, whom I had not met, uh, and then Ricardo Campos, whom I knew from Cerebro. And as a matter of fact, uh, Juan and Ricardo came. Uh, I was going to bring the volume today, but I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't have time this morning. And the, the debate was uh, intense, I think, memorable. And we published that, uh, it's called El Colloquio de Princeton, with Jose Luis Gonzalez and uh, Quintero Rivera, Ricardo Campos, and uh, Juan Flores. And I want to underline that because that, the essay in that volume is perhaps the first essay, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the very first long essay, thoughtful, brilliant, well-informed on the Memorias de Bernardo Vega that had been just published and edited by Cesar Andreu. So it brought together and I reread that essay when Carlos told me last year that he was thinking of uh, uh, organizing uh, this event uh, in honor of uh, Ricardo. And I reread that essay and uh, had not seen it for, really for a long time. And I think it's a wonderful essay that um, should be perhaps read again and more so now uh, just to think uh, this collaboration uh, and uh, between Juan and Ricardo 
and also behind them, this uh, great founder of the Centro, uh, Frank Bonilla, uh, who was able to bring them together. Uh, I think uh, it takes a great deal of open-mindedness, a great deal of generosity, a great deal of vision uh, to do that kind of uh, bringing together. And I'm so happy that that uh, Carlos, whom I did not know at that time, that we met since he invited me to Austin's Community College to teach, and that uh, gave me the opportunity to rethink those years that shaped and reshaped my uh, <coughs> thoughts and my thinking about Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican culture uh, from, um, and to begin to, to <coughs> realize that we indeed had La Memoria Rota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arcadio. Um, Arcadio made mention of the collaboration between Ricardo and Frank Bonilla, and thank you very much for you know bringing that you know, to the forefront here. And I just wanted to point out that one of their collaborations was this little volume here, Industry and Idleness, uh, Frank Bonilla and Ricardo Campos, and it's also being distributed free in the back. So. Make sure you pick up one of these as well. Um, anyone else has some thoughts they'd like to share, reminiscences? Pedro Rivera, thank you. Buenas noches. I took a red eye fly this morning, so find a little inarticulate is because <laughs> I'm still uh, trying to recompose myself. But um, it, many things have been said about Ricardo uh, tonight that uh, I don't need to uh, go any further into them. Uh, I'm still thinking about them. They made me think about Ricardo again. Um, but I just wanted to just mention a couple of things. Uh, and one is that uh, I returned to uh, Puerto Rico about, I met Ricardo in 19, around 1977. And uh, I'd just been in New York City around about three years. And it so happens that Ricardo and I, by some kind of historical coincidence, we landed in New York around the same year, 1974. And uh, I, it took me a couple of years to actually meet Ricardo personally. And when we finally met, um, we started a relationship that lasted until the other day. When I uh, went back to Puerto Rico about 12 years ago, one of the first persons that I went to really see and reconnect with was Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo and I uh, had a, a very intense friendship and collaboration as uh, colleagues in the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, but also uh, as comrades. And uh, I have no problems, Laura, <laughs> in acknowledging my, my, uh, my membership in the Communist Labor Party at that time. So, uh, so Ricardo and I were also comrades in the same political organization. and. So I got to learn about Ricardo uh, many things, uh, from Ricardo, learn about him many things, because in this work together politically, uh, I matured a lot, and, and I matured a lot thanks to him. And I just wanted to briefly mention something about that period in his life. Um, uh, Ricardo was, above all, a revolutionary. And so that he was a communist, and so was I, so am I. <laughs> but the revolutionary, uh, the one big lesson that I learned during those years as to what uh, living in this society means is that and we live in a society, and this is a, an idea that only, not only comes from Marx, but primarily from Marx, but from other 
revolutionary thinkers and practitioners is that a society that we live, societies such as the one we live, uh, and societies that are based on the need to reproduce themselves on the basis of, uh, excuse me, we don't see, on the basis of the exploitation of one group of people over another, be it on the basis of gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, whatever other distinction you want to add to that. Those societies that reproduce themselves on that basis plant the seeds of their own destruction. That's um, the one the fundamental lesson that I learned um, in my years as a young person in Puerto Rico and later on in New York, uh, working, studying, living here. The problem with that is that when you are a, when you think of yourself as a revolutionary, as Ricardo was, and as many of us would think ourselves we, where we are, is that uh, you are also a revolutionary zone that believes that society in which you live in, it is already because it works that way on the basis of that contradiction. It's a society that is bound to implode, is bound to disappear because of its own contradictions. But a revolutionary believes that you need to take an active intervention in that process. That's the difference between someone who thinks of themselves as revolutionary and someone who doesn't. Uh, and, but there's another side to that. As revolutionaries, we also have to face one big challenge. You have to fight to change you have to fight so that that society that is ex basically self-destructing itself, uh, you happen to be living in that society that's self-destructing itself. So the, you face the big <coughs> challenge of making sure that as a society self-destructs, it doesn't destroy you. You don't self-destruct. Ricardo's life, as many people here have very, uh, described in a very dramatic way and very truthfully. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a, a very good example of that, is it, of the revolutionary that fights so that self-destruction of that society you're trying to fight does not get to you, so you don't you dis you self-destroy yourself. I'm not gonna make a judgment here as to whether Ricardo self-destroyed himself or not. That's you know, it's not, <laughs> I'm not gonna make that judgment because and that's, uh, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, we're here to, as we say in Spanish, sembrar la memoria de Ricardo Campos. Cuando uno siembra la memoria, uno no la mata, <coughs> sino que uno la, la siembra con la expectativa de que esa memoria florezca. Y, Esa memoria con todas sus contradicciones florecerá. Y más tarde, pues nosotros entonces, las próximas generaciones, pues, tendrán el beneficio del de florecimiento de esas lecciones. Pero quería enfatizar eso. También quería mencionar un detalle. Eh, Ricardo pues, tenía muchos intereses. Y Ricardo siempre estaba, eh, cuando yo regresé a Puerto Rico, en estos en esta década que, que compartí con él en, en Puerto Rico, pues una de las cosas que compartíamos era entre, en, entre las miles de cosas que compartíamos era su interés por la astronomía. Era un, un astrónomo eh, aficionado, pero conocía mucho la astronomía. Y Ricardo tuvo la generosidad de, de, de cederme a mí su biblioteca. Cuando Ricardo se enteró que él estaba bien enfermo, Eh, él me dio a mí un montón de documentos y de libros, y entre ellos me dio toda una colección de libros de ciencia y de astronomía. Y entre otras cosas, cuando se fue a Nueva York, me dio su telescopio. Eh, un amigo y colega mío, con el cual yo trabajo en Puerto Rico, que también es 
trabaja en cine eh, conoció a Ricardo atrás de mí y desarrolló su propia amistad con Ricardo y eh, mi colega, mi socio le, también es poeta y le escribió a Ricardo un breve poema que quiero compartir con ustedes sobre esa dimensión de Ricardo como actor eh, Clases de inglés. Sí. Red Eye. Ok. Esto se llama Un astrólogo comunista. A Ricardo Campos y su telescopio. El compañero que escribió esto se llama Ismael Cubero. En un lugar finito, inscrito en la infinitud de los universos, un cuerpo exacto, polvo estelar constata la efímera y larga vida del cosmos respira su descubrimiento inhala surge una galaxia exhala muere un humano y se entristece gracias Hi, good evening, everybody. I couldn't resist. Um, and just to say that when I knew Ricardo, mainly I got to know him because, as Carlos said, he and Carlos shared an apartment, and since Carlos is my brother, I would sometimes go over and um, for social, you know, for, to have dinner. Um, and uh, so, of course, I can also say that he's a great, great cook and uh, talk about his generosity and uh, he loved music also and art and his home uh, which happened to be where Carlos was living at that time also was such a pleasant place it was just great and uh, of course since we all were developing a friendship and I guess maybe the three of us were in a very particular moment in each of our lives uh, we really you know, enjoyed socializing, and sometimes uh, Carlos and Ricardo and another friend of mine, and maybe a couple of friends of mine, would come to my place and we would celebrate a birthday or we celebrate Christmas. Um, that was maybe, maybe I recall it as being a lot of times, maybe it wasn't that many times, but I really can say that it was tremendous fun. Um, and I never really got to know Ricardo in the dimension of the uh, intellectual, the theoretician, the revolutionary, even though I did know him as a revolutionary, but in terms of the theoretical work that he did, I really didn't get to know him that much in that aspect. But definitely, I can say that uh, I enjoyed uh, knowing him in that aspect that I did get to know him, and uh, which was an aspect that had another really positive aspect to it, which is that it was shared with my brother, Carlos. So, I just wanted to also say that. Thank you very much. Someone else from the share board? Betty? It's hard as well, I know. Um, hello, my name is Betty Garcia, and um, uh, Ricardo, is, I just found out about a week ago that he passed away, so I'm, I've been very emotional since then. But um, uh, Ricardo was very important to me because um, I was just starting to do, I was in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, and, um, and I was uh, trying to start to do uh, my art at that time, which was as a performer, I was a, a dancer, I was start, starting to uh, do political dance. And I was trying to figure out what first dance to do. And I spoke to a very dear friend of mine at that time. Um, It'll come to you. Jorge, 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 Jorge,
a very dear friend of mine at the time, Jorge Soto, a very important uh, artist as well, and wonderful contributor, an incredible person, um, told me, you should talk to um, uh, Ricardo Campos, and I didn't know Ricardo, because he's a historian, he's a researcher, and he discovered this woman who's been erased from our history books, and her name is Luisa Capetillo. So I said, okay, and he introduced me to, uh, so I went to uh, the Centro de Estudio Puerto Riqueño, I met Ricardo, and he sat down and talked about generosity. He gave me all the material and all the history on Luisa, which I left there so excited that in a week I uh, choreo uh, choreographed the dance, Luisa Capetillo, un ejemplo, and it became really the launch of my political dance career. Um, I did it so many times, it was so, um, such a demand for it, that at times when I was performing it, the people, the audience would say like the songs of the dance and the consignas of the dance while I was performing. Um, uh, and one of the strong consignas that I had uh, shared with Ricardo and he agreed, uh, approved was, Esta lucha del obrero por eso le tiene miedo. And it became, uh, uh, a really powerful consigna. Um, uh, Ricardo, uh, so he, that, that was the beginning of a political dance for me that then uh, la uh, lasted for about 14 years. He was very important to me at the time. And, and another time I did another uh, dance, which he was the historian, the researcher, and gave me all the information for Concha, which I can't remember the rest of the name of the title. but. So Ricardo was a wonderful person on a personal level. Um, he was a musician. I don't know if people know this, but he used to play congas when we were together, and he would play congas and I would dance. Um, and he was a wonderful musician. Also, of course, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, gourmet cook, and he taught me a couple of dishes, which I still cook. Um, uh, it was very painful to me to know that he died and that he was in... Um, uh, the last decade of his life, he had struggled so much. Um, I didn't know that he was here. I, I found that out from the El Señor que lo estaba cuidando. So I'm glad, uh, y gracias tanto por estar con él y, y ayudarlo y estar uh, giving him strength and, and courage. So thank you so much. Hi everyone. Um, this is very difficult for me, but I'm going to say it anyway. Because I've been sitting there, you know, I really, really do not like when people live, leave things out of history, um, especially my working class history. I had an affinity with Carlos, I mean Carlos, you too. It's our history. <laughs> because we both came, him in Puerto Rico and me in New York, from the same lump and proletarian working class backgrounds. I, as he, witnessed drug addiction and what it did to our community. And somebody, the reason I got up here is because Jorge Soto was mentioned. I'm going to talk about drug addiction in our community. And I talk about AIDS. And this is real. And it's still killing us. Especially those, in quotes, intellectuals who need to quiet the pain so that they can think and be the powerful human beings that they are, like Ricardo. I wasn't going to come here today. <laughs> And I came because Ricardo had a very close relationship with my mother. And she really liked him. 
a great deal. So I'm here honoring my mother, who understood Ricardo's pain. Actually, Carlos and Ricardo and nursed my mother back after an operation. And they're home, because she needed an elevator. So that's why I'm here. And it seems like I'm here also. No podemos tapar el sol con una mano. Tú sabes, nuestros artistas, eh? Somebody said, our organic intellectuals, okay? They're quieting the pain today. And we're dying as a people, as a nation, we're dying. And it's up to us to talk the truth. Yes, the man was brilliant. You know, I had the opportunity, a few of us had an opportunity. He was our, our resource person when we studied a Marxist philosophy and theory. And he explained things that nobody could explain to me because he was me and I was him. You know, and I hear C. Felix, who I couldn't read, and he taught me, I mean, he, he basically read what's to be done, what's to be done. He read what's to be done for me. And this is what we did for each other. And I'm so proud to be here, even though I didn't want to come, because what is here today is our parents who struggle, we all come from the roots of the working class. And yes, it took me 11 years to get a BA, because I couldn't read at the age of 17. You know? And I'm you know, the perpetual adjunct. And Ricardo couldn't stay here, because there was a purge of Marxists in the centro. That's another truth, you know? So I give witness to all that, besides his brilliancy and that he was a great cook, you know, a great lover and a great this and a great that. He had so much rage, so much rage that it killed him to his last day. And because we tried to cover the truth with our hands, we weren't there to support him. Okay? We weren't there. So we need to take responsibility for that. However, it shows up for each one of us. And we need to walk in your shoes and continue to work, wage working class struggle wherever we are 24 7. Even though you don't get hired, you know, or people won't talk to me after today. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, a person he loved deeply and became a bright spot inside for a while. And I went up to Pope and, and uh, for the first time I, I, I thought I saw in him a uh, sense of future in his own life. Uh, uh, people that are still alive but are not here, not because they, can, they don't want, didn't want, but because they probably didn't want. When I was very good, Margarita Medina, those two poems that are, are printed there are her gift to this group. Uh, and some theory. I'm sure that the Secretary of General would have loved to hug him. We went to we went off hunting after him in Chicago with Laura. He wanted, Laura, to, Laura he wanted to come, but he's 90 years old. I know. I know. <laughs> he, well, I wanted to be here, but we're all the way detained. Uh, he asked me, he went to was in Puerto Rico, uh, and he asked me to come to Ricardo for him. And Laura and, and myself and other people and, and him and Nelson climbed on a, on a van and went on over the streets of, of Catano. And, and of course, oh, Ricardo, yeah, he was living over yeah, Oh, yeah, he was living over there. And the final was on him. And they walked with such uh, deep respect and love that it was impressive. So they're here with us, in a, in a way, and in a way they share with Ricardo uh, very deep stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm just glad to hear with you guys and celebrate. Sammy's not here. Sammy just had my brother Sammy Taco. He just had a stroke. He's in the but he planned to be here with his Veneto and say goodbye to Ricardo with a booming plena. We uh, know <laughs> Ricardo would have enjoyed deeply. And he sends his love. Uh, everybody. Uh, so people are not, are not here, but are here. Mm -hmm. And a part of this celebration of how we met in our lives uh, a great friend, loyal, general, as you can say, a comrade, and a, and a true life revolutionary. No nonsense. So thank you. I'm sorry. So uh, thank you so much. Well, I think maybe it's time to close. Um, I want to thank everybody for you know being here today. Uh, there's someone else who's on our minds um, as we're here, and I want to wish you know, a speedy recovery. I know it's a person that would have been here if he was able. It's Tato La Viera. Uh, Tato La Viera, as many of you know, is uh, taken very ill. He's been hospitalized, and he's another one like Sammy Tanco. Who, under other circumstances, would have also been here to celebrate the life of the campus. We have some refreshments. We have some photographers, uh, Marino Cornier, and I invite especially those of us that were here some of those early years to come and have some pictures taken. And um, make sure that we get your contact information, emails, and we'll send you a set of the pictures. The publications are there. We urge everybody to, to pick up the piece uh, by Ricardo and Frank Bonilla, Industry and Islands, it's over there, it's been given away. And then, of course, the commemorative publication of his essay, Cultura um, Vera Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you.